So um, I guess obvious place to start is you as a successful YouTuber with currently 350,000 subscribers are living the dream of a lot of students and young people everywhere. How exactly did you kind of get like where you are today? How did you get into kind of making videos for YouTube? Well, successful is a kind way to put it. Uh, I, I reckon, you know, relative to, to what I wanted the channel to be, it's a great success, but relative to other people on YouTube, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean. But um, also, you know, living the dream might be putting it a bit too kindly, given the amount of hate messages I get in my inbox and okay. on Twitter especially. But to be honest with you, if I knew how I did it, I'd do it again. I don't actually quite know what it was. I think what happened was you, you have to be, you have to get really lucky. Like there's, there's no, there's no way to kind of, uh, there's no cover for that. You, you do have to just get, get lucky, but at the same time, you have to be ready for the luck. So like I got really lucky when a video that I put out got picked up on Reddit and on some blogs and stuff. And this was like three, four years ago, got picked up um, and shared around and it got like 10,000 views, which at the time was, was huge. And, I was kind of like, well, if I didn't do anything at that, I could have been like, sweet, I've got a thousand subscribers now, 10,000 views. It would have just, you know, you know, plateaued and that would have been the end of it. But I just immediately jumped on and made another video similar to it just to give people the impression that I was going to keep it up. So they subscribed, they came back to the channel. And then I just had to be like on the ball for the next like month, right? So like there are a lot of people out there putting in twice the effort that I put into my YouTube channel and they don't get anything back from it. And that sucks. But like, when that luck does come along it's going to be dependent on how well you how, how hard you work based on getting that luck as to whether the channel actually becomes a success or not and luckily I had a mixture of luck and it came at a time when I was able to put in the effort and so I just slowly built up my channel from there to where it is today. So, so you say in that initial period you had to kind of be really sort of hard work and put a lot of evidence has it I'm guessing it hasn't stayed like that is it still kind of really demanding having to sort of be in kind of be in demand to put out YouTube videos obviously not necessarily at like scheduled mm. times but it's a fairly regular basis yeah I mean it's, it's demanding if you want growth you know like I was growing a lot faster at the beginning of my channel right now I mean it it, it took months to get from 350,000 to three that's uh, from 300,000 to 350,000 which you know it's a lot of people but relative to the growth that we were the that I was getting before it, it's it's not as much and the reason for that is simply because I'm not uploading as much now that's a choice I made right so if your goal is to grow your channel to as big as it possibly can be, then yeah, it's going to be a grind. You have to keep putting in the effort, keep coming up with content, all that kind of stuff. But because my YouTube channel, I try to treat it as, as a platform on which I can build a career as a speaker or a writer or, or, or something like that. And I just happen to have a YouTube channel. I don't really care too much about the growth. I care about what it's doing for my real life, as it were. Um, so it's actually not too demanding for me, but that's just because... I've made the choice to sacrifice growth for the sake of getting a university education, for the sake of socializing, for the sake of, you know, actually trying to work on a, on a real world job, so to speak. Um, yeah, I, I, but that's the thing. It's, it's kind of up to you, you know, like in the, in the vacation periods, I work a lot harder on YouTube because I've got the time to do it and it becomes a massive drag. You're always trying to come up with content. You're always editing. You're always, and it's not just making the videos, you know, you've got to learn how to edit, you've got to set up the lights, you've got to work on getting camera equipment, all this kind of stuff. Um, so it is a lot of effort, but once your channel gets to a certain point, you're able to, to kind of take a break if you want. You know, if you take a few months off and go back to it, there's still going to be, be, uh, going to be people there. But if you took, take a break right at the beginning, chances are when you go back, everyone's forgotten about you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so... I guess you, you touched on the fact that you kind of want to become, you know, a speaker or a writer. So obviously when you finish uni, you'll be a kind of a crossroads. You'll have the choice. Do you want to start kind of investing all your newfound free time into sort of being, you know, becoming a bigger YouTuber? Or are you going to say, actually, I'm, I'm done with this? Or what, what, what are your plans? Well, the goal certainly isn't to be a YouTuber. You know, I, I don't want, on, on, my, on my gravestone, I'd hate to think that, you know, the word YouTuber would be on there somewhere. That's, that's my worst <laughs> nightmare. I, I, it's like, I want to. I, I like using YouTube, and I'm incredibly grateful for YouTube. But I see it as like, I don't know. It, it, it's difficult to explain. It's like I see it as one of those platforms. Like it's it's like being a columnist or something, right? Like you don't want to be known as a columnist. You, you want to be known as a as a journalist or as a as a as an environmental activist or whatever it is you do. And yeah, you write a newspaper column to help bolster that, and you become quite well known for the for the papers you write or the or the book that you wrote or the video that you made or whatever. But that's not like what defines your career. And that's kind of the goal. So when, when I finish university, 
probably would like to carry on being at university and get some kind of genuine qualification so that I can get a, a job that isn't entirely dependent on how many views you're getting. Um, because that's, that's so un, unreliable, a source of, a, a source of, uh, well, a source of employment, but also a source of income, of, of course, as well. Um, but I, I don't really know, man. Like it's, yeah, I'm kind of like everybody else in in that situation where I just I don't really know what I want to do after university. But luckily, if, if I think about where I was two years ago and try to predict where I'd be now, that is a vegan activist. <laughs> it would have been the most surprising thing in the world. So thinking now, trying to predict where I want to be in two years, I'd, I'd rather just kind of wait and see what happens. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. So um. What, what do you think about YouTube specifically as a platform for content? Because I know more and more people now are kind of uploading at least some of their stuff on, directly onto Patreon. Um, or is, is maybe is podcasting preferable? Um, I, don't, I don't know what you think about it. Because a lot of people are kind of voicing some quite serious complaints about using YouTube as a, as a platform. Yeah, well, YouTube has its, has its problems, but that's just by nature of it being such a big platform. I mean, people like to think that there was some kind of golden age of YouTube and then came the adpocalypse. Um, <laughs> Which, which people called it, where a bunch of companies got a bit funky about who was using their, their advertisements on, on videos that they didn't particularly like and stuff. And people thought that YouTube were, were messing up. But the thing is, like, if you're a massive company and you're, and you're getting billions of hours of video uploaded regularly, and there's no way to manually check all that stuff, like, you have no choice but to have certain policies when it comes to ads. You have no choice but to accidentally get things wrong every now and again. So it's not exactly YouTube's fault, but it, I understand why people wouldn't want to put themselves up to that kind of um, uh, liability, right? Now, again, if you're just getting started out, it's going to be very, very hard to take on the machine that is YouTube. But if, if, you are, if you're getting regular views, if you're a subscriber that people know about, then if you have a problem with YouTube, you can usually get it solved because you know, you, you've got that special email address that you can send a message to, or you can get all your subscribers to get onto YouTube or something, and they'll, and they'll probably change. You know, if PewDiePie complains about something about YouTube, it will probably get fixed in a week. Um, so I understand why people, certainly at the beginning of, of making content, would want to move away from YouTube. Um, not sure about Patreon, because, of course, Patreon is, is, is a crowdfunding platform, and, and most people that I know have used it to kind of supplement content elsewhere they make content and they have their patreon as a separate thing that says if you want to support me monetarily that's how you do it i can imagine more people are, are kind of tempted to use patreon as, as a primary source where it's like it's not i make free content and you can support it if you want but i now make paid content and i do it on patreon like that sounds like a great idea if you want to make paid content patreon's a great platform but that's not i, I don't make paid uh, content most people I know don't make paid content so that's not how I would I would use it I'd never move to patreon in, in that way uh, podcasting is becoming a lot more uh, popular as well because people are just beginning to like long-form content more I, I'm not quite sure why that's happened um, it might be because of the rise of people like Joe Rogan and people are beginning to realize once you spend you know a year or so listening to long-form content you realize that it's actually quite good and you're willing to put in the effort so also a big part of that is that YouTube started um, Kind of judging channels by how many minutes watched rather than how many views they get because that brings in more advertisers that brings them in more money so there's this kind of shift in focus which meant a lot of creators started shifting their focus as well and they figured well if i'm making a video that's an hour long it's basically me talking i may as well put it on itunes as well um again for me like i have a podcast i put it on itunes and spotify and whatnot but i i don't get nearly as much um viewership as i get on youtube so so YouTube is still the primary platform for me, but that's probably just because it's where I started. If I was starting again today, I'd probably do the same thing just because I know YouTube and I like YouTube, but I can understand why people would choose different platforms because there's so many now. Yeah, no, definitely. Podcasts are kind of growing a lot there, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the new trendy, new trendy platform. Um, so you mentioned earlier about, um, about the hate message you get. I was going to ask, is it yeah. kind of draining being in the public eye, like ostensibly as a debater or commentator on contentious issues? Like you must get a lot of people kind of sort of, well, either trying to argue with you or just straight up kind of hurling abuse at you. I find it quite fun. Um, it's like playing a game of squash or something. You have to just like <laughs> whack them back against the wall. Like it's not for everyone. I'll give you that. Like I have friends and colleagues, especially my female friends and colleagues who are on YouTube who get some of the, they get hate that I couldn't even imagine. And I don't know how they deal with it and I admire them for it. Um, sure. I mean, I, get my fair share of pretty nasty stuff as well but the majority of the time it's either playful or it's so bad that it sounds like it might be a parody like half of the things that i respond to i'm like am i be, um, is someone trying to have me on here like are they are they parodying someone because like this this can't be real 
and it, it's quite easy to just kind of to, to throw it back at them and especially if you're on twitter and you've got followers like it's, like it's it, it's not going to be too harmful to your reputation if someone tweets at you because you can just you can just retweet it with some kind of witty comment or something and, and people will be on your side like I enjoy the process. I don't think it's conducive to good discourse, right? A lot of people will say it's really important to respond to these people on Twitter because it, you know, creates a space for, for countering bad ideas with proper discourse. No, it's just, just fun, you know? Like, it's just, it's not, it's not going to do anything for anybody. No one's seriously turning to Twitter for, like, useful philosophical education or information. So I don't, I don't mind it, but I, I, I don't take it, to, that's because I don't take it too seriously. A lot of people do take it seriously, and a lot of people should should take it seriously if the hate is getting serious you know if someone tweets at you saying i know where you live and i'm going to kill your children like yeah you should probably get onto the authorities but if someone tweets and says you know um you, you you're the most immoral person i've ever met because you linked red meat to heart disease and i'm just going to be like fine whatever you're, you're welcome to that opinion you know you, you, you are doing more for the vegan movement than i ever could have like the best vegan activists half the time are carnivorous twitter users right because like they, they they are doing so much more to show why uh, a move towards a plant-based lifestyle is the more ethical and rational decision than i ever could in in a single tweet they managed to do that managed to do what i couldn't do in an entire essay so i really don't mind it so i guess one interesting thing about kind of that that sort of the obligation to argue on twitter and youtube as well is that like if you are kind of a bit petulant or you do something that you say something that you later think god i wish i hadn't said that it's kind of stuck there in the public eye. So you recently yeah. uploaded a very entertaining video uh, called Cosmic Skeptic Debunked, where you responded to your own previous videos. Is that difficult for you? Because obviously the rest of us, when we kind of say or do something stupid, um, you know, it's found mm. like a hot take that we later really regret, we can kind of just get away with it. But you, you can't really, can you? Yeah, uh, that was fine because that video was like, I, I, I put forward a philosophical opinion, right? And now I'm going back to it and saying that was a stupid philosophical opinion. And it's like, there, there, are, there are more embarrassing things in life than to have kind of gotten wrong whether you can deduce personality characteristics from the first cause of the universe. Like, that's not like the most embarrassing thing to mess up on. Now, it's different if, you, if you're like making social commentary or something. Like, you know, if, if someone makes a tweet that says, I don't know, um, abortionists are the greatest mass murderers that the USA has ever known. And then five years later, they become a pro-choice activist and they see that tweet, they'll be like, oh my God, like it would be, it would be horrendous if people brought that up and it, it would just be kind of a, a social nightmare for them. Um, luckily, I, I don't think I've ever said anything that I don't stand by because even the views that I've said that I disagree with now, I like to think that I've said them, that, I, that I'm always careful to say things in such a way that I'm conscious to the fact that I could change my mind. Um, or if I, if I do, then I will just go back and just go back and apologize, especially like the only example I can really think of is with veganism because of the fact that before people go vegan they tend to treat it as a bit of a kind of funny interesting philosophical side thought so there were tweets some, someone tweeted at me like three four years ago saying you know at cosmic skeptic why what's stopping you from going vegan and i think i just responded with the word meat or something or bacon right which obviously genius and hilarious and so original um and he responded like listen i i really don't think that you would be this flippant on any other ethical issue like what are you doing? And he, he was seriously trying to engage me and I ignored it. And three years later, I, I found that tweet and I went back and I, I, I apologized to the guy. I, I, I was like, yeah, you, you were right. Like all this time because I felt bad about it. Um, so if, if it's really that bad, like the best thing you can do is, is preempt it. Don't let someone else bring it up and then you have to be on the defensive. Bring it up yourself, own it. Say, look, I've noticed I said this thing wrong and I disagree with it. That's what I did with my debunked video. It wasn't like somebody else made a video that said, this video is really bad, and now I have to make a video like, oh, oh yeah, no, I, I, I guess you're right, but, but I knew that anyway, and, and this is why I was wrong. It feels really defensive. Like, like be the first person to recognize your own old mistakes. Right? Take the power away from other people. Not only will it be a more effective way to debunk your old ideas, but it'll also make people have more respect for you because they can see that you're actually trying to get to the truth. Well, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So one opinion you've been advocating a lot recently is the, the link between um, the meat industry and the risk of pandemic. Do you want to see if you can, in, in, in a minute or less, see if you can yeah. kind of persuade the uninformed observer that that's the case? 
Well, we're not entirely sure still of what caused the coronavirus pandemic specifically. Most people think that it came from, you know, somebody eating a bat in China or something to that effect, which, yet yeah, loosely you could say that that means that the coronavirus is due to meat eating. But it's a bit unfair because people generally don't eat uh, bats. And a lot of people might be against the kind of market conditions like the wet markets in, in China or something like that. But what we do know is that regardless of what caused this pandemic, the greatest threat uh, the greatest threat to causing another pandemic right now is factory farming. Not only that, but also things like antibiotic resistance um, is being fueled not by human consumption, but by animal consumption. The vast majority of the antibiotics that we that we produce are being fed to livestock, and that's where the, the resistance is growing. And it's the same thing with uh, with with pandemics. I mean, factory farms are disease ridden hell holes, which if if those diseases just managed to jump from animals to humans, like the whole world could be shut down again and it could be even worse. There was recently news about uh, a new strain of swine flu that had been found in, in pig farms in, in China, I believe. And it was all over the news. It was front page of the BBC. And I remember thinking, I think I can, I think I can come up with a solution for this. Like, I, I think I might have an idea. And, I, and not only that, but I think I might have been peddling this idea for the past year since I've been vegan. And not only that, but I think that vegan writers and activists have been peddling that idea for years and years and years before I was even vegan. There's a book by Jonathan Safran Foa called Eating Animals, Should We Stop? in which he discusses the risks of pandemics. Um, and he, he basically predicts the coronavirus. Now, again, like what he predicted, the, the, the specific diseases that he talked about are still a problem, they're still a threat, they could still become a, a massive uh, human health catastrophe uh, even after the coronavirus. But the thing that I noticed was that before we had a national pandemic because it seems so absurd. Like if someone suggests that there could be a pandemic that would shut the world down, you'd think that that was sounded ridiculous. So when vegans were, were, were warning about it before the pandemic took root, people said, you're hyperbolizing, you're using alarmist tactics, these ridiculous vegans, they're trying to do anything to, to help their cause. Then the pandemic actually happens. And then we come out and say, hey, you know, this really sucks. And you know that the single biggest way to increase the risk of a pandemic like this is by continuing factory farming then people say oh you're you're trying to you're trying to step on this this national tragedy to pr to promote your diet like these vegans will do anything to promote their diet it's like no we, we are <laughs> we're, we're using a national tragedy to point to the cause of such national tragedies right like before when we warn about it before it happens we're alarmists and when we try to identify the cause of pandemics after they happen we're uh, we're hyperbolizing and we're, we're politicizing a tragedy. It's like, we can't win. But I can tell you that if you care about pandemics and if you care about stopping them coming in the future, the single best thing you can do to eliminate your individual contribution to that risk is to stop eating factory farmed animal products. Yeah. So, so do you think that this, like the, this pandemic is going to be a game changer or is it going to be, like you said, kind of people sort of digging in and saying, no, you can't use this to push your agenda? Well, as I tweeted the other day, you'd think that experiencing a, a, an internationally debilitating pandemic would motivate us to rid ourselves of the greatest risk of, you know, internationally debilitating pandemics. But bacon though, you know, like people are so unwell. I used to think that people wouldn't give up eating animal products because they're selfish, right? And, you know, no problem with that. A lot of people, you know, why should you have to give up something that you, that you like? But I used to think, people wouldn't give up meat because they're selfish but now even when it's in their best interest to give up meat they still won't do it so it's not even selfishness it, it's we are addicted to this stuff to the extent that any one of the arguments would work on its own even if it just was the best thing you could do to reduce your environmental footprint to go vegan you should still have a moral motivation to do it even if it was just the moral case about uh, reducing suffering to animals, you should do it. Even if it was just the pandemic issue, even if it was just antibiotics. But we can sit here and say, we have the solution, like we have the Swiss army knife of the future, as Philip Willem has put it. We have an answer to one of the greatest moral tragedies and emergencies that we're currently facing. The greatest risk to future pandemics, which is like the most important issue on people's minds at the moment, antibiotic resistance, which is one of the greatest medical emergencies at the moment, and environmental uh, contribution to environmental catastrophe. And all of these things, all of them can be addressed by one simple life change. And people aren't willing to do it. Why? Not because of some reasoned defense about why, you know, meat actually isn't causing all of these things. Like they'll accept that all of those things are true. And they'll just say, oh, but I just love cheese. I just can't give up cheese. 
Well, I'm, you know, forgive me for not taking you morally seriously if, that, if that's the extent of your position. Uh, so to answer your question, which I realize now I didn't answer, um, I don't think that this is going to do anything, right? That, like, you'd think that it would, right? But, but history has shown time and time again that you can throw anything you like, right, at people to show that this is why meat eating is destroying the planet, destroying animals, destroying yourself, and they still don't want to change. So I don't think it's going to be like actual instantiations of the risks that we're warning about that are going to cause people to finally give up meat. It's going to be sitting them down and having a stern talk with them about personal responsibility and saying, it's not enough to just show you how bad the effects are going to be, but to make people realize that it's happening because of us. And yes, the fact that animals suffer and the fact that we are responsible for it is one of the most inconvenient facts that, that exists, but it's a fact that does exist. And I, I just, I just can't take seriously anybody who thinks that a fondness for camembert is in the same moral universe as pandemics and antibiotic resistance and torture of animals and environmental catastrophe. I, I just can't do it. I think I must be missing something. Like I, I, all, the, all the time that I try and talk about this stuff, in all my talks, I always just say to people, look, just tell me what I'm missing. Because this isn't like, I see your argument, here's my argument. It's like, I just don't understand how people can't put this together. That is, that is very interesting, but simultaneously extremely depressing. So I may um, change the subject there. <laughs> yeah, um, I understand. So Channel 4 News once gave you the title Free Speech Activist. Would you say that's a fair description? <laughs> um, I mean, probably not anymore because I don't talk about it much at the time. I mean, they didn't ask me. Oh, maybe they did. I, I can't remember. Uh, certainly at the time, I was very the, the, the problem the problem there is is with the word free speech right because that can be misleading as i said in that very interview it's more about the free expression of ideas uh, obviously like to be a to be a free speech absolutist or a free speech activist wouldn't entail me defending someone's right to like sell you know to, to type up harry potter in the chamber of secrets and try and sell it and you know cry free speech when they get hit with copyright infringement it's about the expression of ideas and that I still stand by absolutely and, and although I'm not particularly active in my defense of it um, I would be if I needed to be if someone asked me about it I wouldn't hesitate to still defend those same positions that the expression that the free expression of ideas is one of the most important rights that a human being can have yeah. okay so that that's quite like an important kind of topic at the moment I mean so as a free speech activist does the kind of mm. perceived cancel culture that is particularly prevalent at universities such as our own does that is that something that actively concerns you uh, I think it, it, it depends on specifically what you're talking about, um, because, like, do I think that a that a, a student body should have the right to to not invite a particular speaker because they don't like what they're saying? Absolutely, like, of course, that shouldn't even be a, a up for debate. A, a private institution can invite whoever it likes to come and speak. Do I think that once that person has been invited, that it's that 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 institution has a right to then disinvite them? Yeah, it does have a right to do so. Do I think that that like morally upright like if it's purely due to the fact that people didn't like the fact that this institution were having this person speak then i think it's probably a bad idea to disinvite them for that reason anyway but they have the right to and they're, and they're more than welcome to they, they can do that if they like but that's a whole separate question to what people often mean by cancel culture when they when they're talking about somebody's entire career and life getting destroyed because they made a homophobic joke on twitter like five years ago like this term cancel culture is, is such an umbrella for, for these wildly different areas of public life that I think it's, it's unhelpful to talk about it meaningfully. And one thing I will say about cancel culture is I think it misses the point. I think it fails by its own standard. Reason being that what cancel culture essentially does, what, what, what is the aim of cancel culture? As far as I can see, it's to deter other people from holding these kinds of views. It's to say, look, you're not going to get away with this, right? Problem is they do get away with it. Because cancel culture, what it does is it focuses on a single individual that they happen to have caught out and they give them hell, right? But studies have consistently shown that certainty of capture is more important when it comes to deterrence than severity of the punishment, right? Um, this, is, this, is, this comes up a lot in legal philosophy, I believe. Uh, the idea that if you actually want to psychologically deter people from committing a crime, you're better off making them know that they will be captured than increasing the crime. For instance, um, if, if all of a sudden the, the penalty for smoking marijuana was the death penalty, like that probably wouldn't deter as many people as you think because people, people are so unlikely to be caught or prosecuted. However, if the penalty for smoking marijuana was a hundred pound fine, 
that people knew they were going to get caught when they did it, then the rates would drop like immediately, right? So with cancel culture, like applying that kind of psychological logic, you, you think, well, what we're doing is, is we're essentially saying like, if we catch you, we're going to give you hell. You are not going to be employed. You, you are not going to be able to make friends. You're not going to be able to say anything in public without getting absolutely, uh, without getting absolutely destroyed for it by your Twitter followers and by the whole world and the internet. But what would be more effective is an actual proportioned response to what they said that says, hey, listen, you said this, we're going to punish you in, in, in this way. We're, we're going to punish you by making you publicly apologize. We're going to punish you by uh, getting your employer to have to issue a statement or something like that, fine. But making sure that that's more comprehensively spread out across the whole culture of Twitter. We, we, need, to, we need to develop a culture that isn't cancel individuals like and, and all hop on one person, but like treat every like create create a culture where everybody is kind of held to a proportionate standard where they know that if they say something they're going to get called out for it um even if the even if the punishment is less severe right they're not going to have their lives destroyed for it that certainty of being called out for it is what's going to deter them not the knowledge that if they do happen to be get to, to get caught the punishment's going to be super severe so i think cancel culture fails by its own standards because it it takes the punishment which deservedly should be proportionately spread across everybody that's doing things wrong or has done things wrong in the past it's taking all of that that should be spread across thousands of people and building it all up and putting it on a single person and i don't think that's healthy i don't think that's helpful and i don't think it's moral but some would say um that what we is now observed and is now labeled cancel culture really is kind of the in, the increase in that accountability that you're talking about in the sense that now people if you you aren't going to get away with saying offensive things on twitter and being in the public eye because now it's far easier for kind of angry mobs of people on twitter or whatever to to, to catch people so it, yeah. it, it's not a, that's actually an, an upside of what is now called cancel culture that the kind of people in power don't get away with doing and saying offensive things because they are now more kind of there's more transparency and accountability would you not say that that um that's a positive rather than negative of, of, of modern day cancel culture? Well, not exactly, because the golden rule of the philosophy of punishment is that any punishment has to be proportionate to the crime. Like, that is the most important thing about all of this. So the accountability has to be uh, proportionate. For example, I don't think people should be able to get away with cheating on their partner. I think that's a horrible thing to do. It's an immoral thing to do, and I think it makes you a terrible person, right? But that doesn't mean that I, that I think you should never, ever be employed for the rest of your life. And that in 10 years down the line, somebody should be able to fire you from your dream job because 10 years ago you cheated on your partner. You shouldn't get away with it in the sense that people should be aware that you did it. You should apologize for it and you should genuinely repent. But I don't think it should ruin your life, right? Like it, it's one thing to say that people should be held accountable. It's another thing to say that to ensure that people are held accountable, we're going to make their life a living hell regardless of, of how proportionate that is to the thing they actually did. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people have done things which are deserving of, of genuine, like, like it, it's those times when I kind of wish hell existed so that people could go there. People like the, the police officers who killed George Floyd, for instance. But what do, people, what do people say of these people? Not that they should be cancelled, but that they should go to jail, right? Like, when the punishment is actually bad enough, we have proportionate uh, punishment, or at least you know we, we would in an ideal society with a good legal system, uh, which would be something like imprisonment, right? But like when it comes to less, so, so just to be clear, like when we're talking about things that people have actually done that that are deserving of of a life in jail, it's like yeah, the answer to that is to put them in jail for life. Like there you go. Um, what I mean to say is like there are certain situations in which the more extreme expressions of cancel culture are more justifiable but a lot of the time we're not talking about that we're talking about somebody who made a poor joke online or something like that i saw one recently i think and i can't remember this entirely well but uh there was there were some girls on snapchat i saw this on twitter who they they got like a tan or something they had like a suntan and they were showing off their tan line and they said something like oh you know we look more mexican now or something like that and this person on twitter that she, she messaged them and said like what do you mean by this? And they were just kind of like, oh, because, you know, we, we, our skin's got tanned and Mexicans have tanned skin. And she was like, that's really, that's, that's racist. That, that's not on. And they were like, girl, I don't think it's racist. Like, what are you talking about? And, and, and this girl in response, she took their Snapchat name and put it on Twitter and it went, and it went viral and they're now Twitter famous. Now, you know, they, they shouldn't have done that Snapchat. 
from the from the impression I got, I think they genuinely just didn't understand why that might be a problem. And and sure, maybe there's an argument to be made that they should have known and they deserve some kind of uh, retribution for it. Fine, but do they deserve to have their personal information put online and become famous on Twitter and have the entire internet going and 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 and, and giving them hell? Like, no. Clearly, the answer is no. Like, they deserve to be told why what they did was wrong. They deserve to probably be socially pressured in, in, into apologizing for it and rec- and, and, and um, educating themselves into, into how, how to be more racially sensitive. Like, yeah, they deserve some kind of recuppance or comeuppance, whatever the word is. But what they don't deserve is the absolute, the, absolutely everything that Twitter can muster, right? Which is what they're now getting, if you look at the, resp- the response to that, to that, to that tweet. Um, again, it's not to say that they don't deserve some kind of punishment, but the punishment has to be proportionate. And, and in no way can I see how that would be proportionate. So like, yeah, sure. Like you say cancel culture is beneficial because it holds people to account. Yeah. So would like, so would, so would guillotining anybody who cheats on their girlfriend, but that would be a bad idea. So to kind of jump straight back on what you're saying before. So would you then say that your issue with this phenomenon is it's kind of lack of, I guess, lack of sense of perspective. If hypothetically it were as it is now, but um, you know, less less offensive comments were um, kind of jumped upon less harshly and less kind of widely, and um, only sort of things like, like for example, the um, the cop, you know, the cop um, who killed George Floyd being filmed. That obviously we wouldn't call that cancel culture because it's it's more severe. But it was an instance of a person in power doing something that social media meant. They could be held accountable for, and they are now facing the consequences of. So, if it were as it is now, but just with kind of mor- moral, you know, moral gradation and nuance, where when people could recognise less serious issues, would that then be fine? Again, we just got to make sure that we're careful about identifying exactly what we want the results to be, and being careful that whatever we're implementing is actually going to achieve that goal. The thing that was good about the person filming and and making public the video of, of George Floyd's murder was that it led to an arrest that probably wouldn't have otherwise happened. I have no doubt that those police officers would get off scot-free if it weren't for that individual who happened to be filming at the time. Um, it wasn't good because it allowed the internet to destroy their lives or whatever. Like the principal, the principal benefit of that, of that being caught on camera was that they can now face due process. Um, however, it's fair to say that maybe there's some kind of problem with the legal system such that you also need the social pressures. Um, fine. But like, again, we need to, right, we're talking about an actual crime here, right? Like an actual crime that we would all agree should be a crime. Um, some people think that making a racist joke should be a crime. Most people don't. It's, it's in a different category, right? It's a different type of holding people to account. We, we need to hold people socially accountable. And that, that's what we've done for all of, uh, for all of human history. Hold on, bear with me. I've got notification going off it, get rid of that. Um, yeah, for, for all of human history, we've held people socially accountable. It's one of the ways that, that human beings developed as a species. We developed these social mechanisms for enforcing ethics by holding people socially accountable for, for things that they do that we, that we disapprove of. Human, humanity has never seen anything like the power of, of social media. We've never seen, uh, only in the past few decades, have we seen an ability for literally anyone on the planet, not just public figures, but anyone on the planet, to become the center of the world's entire attention internationally, right? Like, this is brand new. We've got to be careful with this weapon, right? Because what we're, what we're doing is the equivalent of, you know, finding some like finding that there's a, a corrupt member of parliament and so dropping a nuclear bomb in Westminster. Like we have a, we have a weapon of, of unbelievable power here and we're targeting it at individuals who made a bad joke on Snapchat, right? This is a bad idea. Now you ask, what if we kind of changed it? What if we kind of, you know, lowered the switch so the weapon wasn't quite as powerful? What if we just held people accountable? Then like, I think this is just what morally upstanding people should do anyway. Like if you see your friend say something that's, that's insensitive, then say to them, listen, like you probably shouldn't have said that. Uh, and here's why. And like, I'm quite upset by that and see their reaction. If they go, Oh, I'm sorry, man. I didn't realize. Yeah. I won't do it again. Fine. If they, if they try to back themselves up, if they say, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. Then yeah, maybe you need to up the notch. 
maybe you need to be a bit more, then you need to say, no, okay, actually, no, this is wrong and, I, and this is why. And if you keep this up, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, right? Like you, you keep kind of increasing the social pressure until they, until they realize that they've done something wrong. Um, eventually you might have to give up. Some people might not realize, or maybe you're wrong. Maybe they haven't actually done something wrong. Either way, what you need to do to be sensible about this is start minimal and turn it up until you get to the point at which that level of social pressure will actually bring about the result you want. Um, and that's where you end it. You get the result, it's finished. What you don't do is turn up the dial all the way and give it to them all at once. Because sure, yeah, that's going to work 100% of the time, um, but it's probably going to do more harm than good. Okay. Um, yeah, I know that, that's fair enough. Um, so I'm just going to kind of zone in on something you said earlier about, about the expression of ideas being what we need to protect. So a while ago, you um, gave a platform to Douglas Murray in one of your videos, who many people would say has voiced some fairly kind of abhor abhorrent opinions on, say, Victor Orban, the English Defence League, Peggy the, that arguably border on, on racist. And obviously, it was a debate, your video, and you did challenge his views. But um, do, you, do you stand by that decision to kind of to give him a platform from which to kind of express his views? Now, to be clear here, um, like, legally speaking, I stand by anybody's right to do that. Morally speaking, I stand by my right to do that, but not necessarily everybody's. Because one of my one of my one of the problems that I saw when I was preparing for that interview was any interview that Douglas Murray did, the interviewer would just be kind of nodding along. And after anything Douglas said, they'd say the phrase, thanks for that, and then they'd move on. You might you might notice that in, in bad interviews. Like what happened is you you'll ask the, the interviewer will ask a question, they'll rail off about something, and at the end they'll just go, okay, thanks for that. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask you about, and then they'll go on to something else. Like, no, like, they've just said something. Like, why are you there? Like, th Douglas Murray could have just sat and, and talked to a camera himself. Like, why are you there if not to actually engage with what they're saying? So my goal was to basically say, look, on the one hand, you criticize Extinction Rebellion protesters because uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and, and on the other hand, you're talking about transgender people saying that, like, you know, it, it somehow, like, certain elements of the trans movement go against science or whatever. And I'm saying, but like, like you, you just said to me, like in the interview, he said to me, the science is pretty clear on chromosomes or something like that. And I thought to myself, what if I just turn around to you and said, the science is pretty clear on climate change. Like, I think you're being hypocritical in the way you're approaching these, these problems. And I compared him to an Extinction Rebellion protester, which kind of rubbed him up the wrong way, I think. Um, like it wasn't a comfortable interview, right? It was cordial because I wanted to like, I didn't want him to feel like he was being attacked because I wanted to get genuine answers out of him. Not, I didn't want him to be on the defensive, but I wasn't there to be his friend, right? So yeah, I absolutely stand by my moral right to interview people who are culturally significant and challenge the views that they hold that I haven't seen challenged elsewhere in other interviews that they're doing, especially knowing that a lot of people are gonna see the interview uh, who maybe don't know that much about Douglas Murray and it will help to bring these things to light. Like, absolutely stand by my right to do so. Simply giving, and besides, I didn't give him a platform. He's far more famous than I than, <laughs> than yeah, I am. No, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, so it's like, it's not like, it's not like I would take a random racist off the street and say, hey, come on my podcast, because I want to, you know, I, I want to debate you in front of 300,000 people. Uh, it's like, well, here's someone who already has a platform, is already saying these things, has a regular com column in whatever newspaper he writes for. It's like, I'm not going to increase his, yeah. his, I'm not going to increase the reach of his ideas yeah, by having him on my channel, except to the extent that I'm engaging and challenging them. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. And I do think it's very important that you, that you did challenge him because I think there is, as you say, there is, there is a very important difference there, but I guess where the kind of the potential controversy can come from is, is um, kind of the idea that by engaging with him, you are treating his, some of his ideas as legitimate. And I guess that's the question that, that, that I need to ask you is, do you, so you talked about how you know we need to ensure that the expression of ideas is acceptable. An idea, mm -hmm. an idea can be to attack someone on the grounds of their identity, and that is what some people mm -hmm. would say um, Douglas Murray has at least verged on doing. Um, is that a legitimate idea that you know people are lesser than other people because of the colour of their skin, and is it one that ought ought to be treated as a legitimate idea that should be allowed to be expressed? Well, to be clear, I, I'm I'm not sure that Douglas Murray has has ever said anything that I would. That, that I would kind of label as such. He may have done and I, I, I wouldn't have heard it. Um, but uh, as far as I know, like he, he, he did a debate about like Islam once being a religion of violence. And a lot of people will see that as an attack on Muslims as people, but that's, that's not what it was. Yeah, no. um, but I understand why people might have that view. Now, there's a difference between legitimizing a view and taking it seriously, right? 
depends what you mean by legitimacy. Like, do I think that that view is legitimate in that it has any kind of moral legitimacy? Absolutely not. But that doesn't mean I, I, that doesn't mean we shouldn't take it seriously, right? Because a lot of people are listening to what this person is having to say, and even if it's something abhorrent, even if it's something that's, that's outwardly racist, if a lot of people are listening to it and they're becoming convinced by it, and like because this person is a powerful orator, and you know he, he's he's managing to get people to, and I'm not talking about Douglas Murray here, I'm talking about a, a general you know racist figure that we can hypothesize, and they've got a movement, they've got a they've got a column in a national newspaper, etc., and I'm given the opportunity on my platform, which is known and subscribed to for the very purpose of debating ideas specifically, I've got an opportunity to counter that influence with the person themselves and potentially embarrass them in front of hundreds of thousands of people. Like, not only do I think I'm morally permitted to do so, I, I think I have a moral obligation to do so. Okay, okay, so let, let's take Douglas Murray out of the equation and kind of make it more hypothetical. If, mm. so if, if like, even if we just say talk about Nazism, which obviously Nazism itself um, isn't, you know, neo-Nazism is kind of, a, some would say it's a rising trend, but if, say, a majority of people in the UK voted for a Nazi party as an election, would you respect that as a result? Would you say, no, fair enough, that's what the people have voted for? Is it a legitimate ideology in that sense? Well, I don't, I mean, I certainly wouldn't respect the decision. If, if we've decided to live in a, in, a, in a democracy, then we need to accept that one of the one of the pitfalls of that is sometimes people will vote for things that aren't in their best interest. Sometimes people will vote for things that are evil. Sometimes evils will befool them, right? But that's a problem with democracy and a problem with the people. I wouldn't respect the result in saying, well, you have to respect their opinion. Like, no, I don't respect their opinion. I think their opinion is, 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 is trash. Um, and I would fight it to the, to, to the very last. But if I've kind of signed this imaginary contract that says I'm going to live in a democracy and play by its rules and the way I would challenge it is through the democratic process um, and the only way to do that would be to actually engage with these people in a public forum and show why their views are trash um, there would be no other way to do it otherwise what you'd have to do is just kind of like resentfully sit around and hope that one day things change like what are you going to do if not challenge these ideas right yeah sure so you live in a society where a majority of people have voted for a Nazi party to come into power what are you going to do about it you, you have no other option in a, demo, in, in a democratic society than to use democracy unless you want to do some kind of direct action, which a lot of people would do and perhaps should do. You know, if, if the laws are unjust, then you probably shouldn't be following them right now. Now, that doesn't mean you should be violent or anything like that, but like nonviolent um, uh, civil disobedience is historically, it seems, one of the most effective ways to bring about change in a democratic society where the majority are in favor of something evil. Um, but again, that's about like raising public awareness, telling people what the problems are, like, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I, I, I kind of, I, I, I suppose I, I find it a strange question to say like, because I think that someone has a right to express a view that I find intolerable, I would thereby somehow respect their view because it became the majority that voted a political party into office. It's like, no, I, I've never in my life, uh, defended the views of of Steve Bannon despite making a video defending his right to free speech. Uh, the problem is of course that the only people that are attacked, uh, the, the, the only people who, who people want to take free speech away from generally are assholes, right? Like they're generally people who are saying pretty nasty stuff. So if I'm defending the principle of free speech, unfortunately by chance I end up generally de seemingly defending assholes. I don't enjoy that. That sucks. It, 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 it's, a, it's a really unfortunate reputational problem with defending free speech is that just because of the way that it works, because of the way that, uh, because of, how can I put this? Um, because, because the people who, who will be subject to having their free speech taken away are going to be saying horrible things. It's really easy to be misinterpreted as defending the horrible things and instead of defending the person's right to say it, right? Uh, and that's probably the biggest problem and why most people don't want to come out in favor of free expression of discourse because it's, it's often kind of stuck to bad ideas. And a lot of the time, people who say that they're in favor of free speech are actually just in favor of bad ideas. It's very easy to hide behind the veneer of free speech to defend your bad ideas. If someone says, what you just said was racist, and they say, yeah, but free speech, 
like they're not a free speech activist they're probably just a racist whereas if someone says what this person over there said was racist and someone else says yeah i agree with you and that's horrible but they should have the right to say it because if you try and ban them from saying it you're going to have far worse effects on society than their individual racism like that's not defending the racist that's defending a human right so um i, d I don't want to put your m words into your mouth here so let me know if i'm kind of misconstruing you but are you of the opinion then that we need kind of viewpoint neutrality when we kind of legislate on free speech, when we kind of take an attitude to this, i.e. we ought to treat an ideology, like, you know, an idea that is racist um, with kind of the same way we would treat an idea that is not racist, let's say, like liberalism. Do you think those should be kind of um, handled in the same way, i.e. through civil discourse? I, I don't think that they should be given the same moral weight or legitimacy I don't think they should be given ideological neutrality. I think that they should be given legal blindness, as as is everything else, right? Like, do do I think that like, you know, a murderer should be treated in the same way by the by the criminal justice system as an innocent person? Like, yes, the whole point of of the criminal justice system is to be blind and to work out where people are actually wrong and where they're deserving of punishment. The same thing should be true of free discourse, like from the perspective of, of which idea should be allowed to be spoken, be neutral. But from the position of talking about them and judging them and uh, engaging with them, absolutely no, uh, absolutely not. We don't need ideological neutrality. We need legal neutrality. Okay, um, that's fair enough. So, so well, I'm just gonna try and pin you down in terms of what you think um, expression of ideas should extend to, because obviously that's what, you know, I can understand why that's what should be upheld. Is a racial slur an idea that should be allowed to be expressed? Uh, no, I don't think that a racial slur in isolation is an expression of an idea. Again, like, it all depends on context, obviously. Um, if, somebody, if somebody is just calling someone a racial slur, then I think you could consider that harassment. Um, well, yeah, you would consider that harassment, let me rephrase. Um, or rather, it is harassment, <laughs> like, forget the consideration. Yeah. Um, so, so, does that, so a verbal attack on someone because of their identity, is that, is that then a fair description of harassment rather than ideas? I think so, although I think sometimes it might be both. Like somebody might have an idea that because of someone's skin color, generally speaking, they're worth less. That would simultaneously be an expression of idea and harassment, in which case that, we've, that's essentially, something that should be protected. we've essentially got two, two rights that are coming into conflict, the right to the expression of ideas and the right to be free from harassment. And I think generally speaking, these things need to be considered uh, individually. We can't have a, an overarching rule that says in any situation in which someone feels harassed by speech, that speech should be banned going forward. Um, but we also can't have a rule that says you should be able to say anything you like to a person directly in any way, shape or form, and that be protected, uh, uh, or at the very least, that if it does fall under free speech, it therefore nullifies you from any other kind of legal or moral consequences. Um, the other thing to note, of course, is that we need to be careful to distinguish between legal and moral uh, uh, rights um, in that, like I can think that somebody should have the legal right to express an intolerable idea, um, but it, they, don't have the, they don't have the moral right to go around saying it to everybody. Um, I don't know, let me, let me think about what you're, what you're asking. You're saying, I guess you're, you, you're kind of asking like, at what point do we finally say this is, this is, even whether or not it's protected under free speech, that isn't enough to actually just allow you to say it. Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that question, right? Like, I don't know where the line would be drawn, but I know that somebody who points at someone in the street and says, I'm going to kill you, should not be protected because it's their free speech. But I also know that somebody who, uh, I don't know, I, I, I think that like Charles Murray may be a racist, I don't know, but I do think that he does have the right to publish the bell curve. The line is somewhere between those, and I don't know where it is, but I don't know when a middle-aged person becomes old-aged, but I know that a 45-year-old is middle-aged and a 90-year-old is old-aged, even if I don't know where the line is drawn. I think, I, well, yeah. I th I, as a side note, I think Charles Murray is kind of a unique case because that there is some pseudoscience going on there, but we definitely yeah. won't get into that. Um, I'm going to let you hook off the hook on the overtly political conversation, but I, I think it is important to ask, like, you're, you kind of are primarily a philosophical YouTuber, but obviously as, ev as evidently such an ardent defender of free speech, you are 
going close to politics there do you have any desire mm -hmm. to kind of venture into more political topics in your kind of videos and podcasts and in your career i shouldn't think so no uh, in fact that's one of the reasons why when i've spoken about free speech in the past i talk about it broadly i i, I have applied it to particular cases to use as examples but uh, generally the reason that I'm doing that is to defend the, the general philosophical principle of free speech because free speech is at root a philosophical issue it's, it's an issue of political philosophy not an issue of political science um, I'll talk about political philosophy sure because you know it's difficult to tell what the difference is really uh, essentially between politics and philosophy when you're talking about the ideas behind them but I'm not going to venture from political philosophy into political science as far as I can see I, I don't particularly care for talking about current affairs for instance, um, but I will use current affairs as an example, or I will use a current affair as an example to underpin some kind of general point about uh, political philosophy. But I'm really not a politician. I couldn't be a politician. I couldn't be a political commentator. Um, I'm not very good at it. And uh, as as you can probably tell from what I've said about free speech, like I can't I can't give you. Uh, an actual practical real world answer to specific example cases. I can tell you what my general philosophical guiding principles are, my ethical guiding principles are, uh, but I'm still very much kind of just trying to work it out, right? When I make these videos and I make these speeches about free speech, the reason I'm doing it is for someone to come along and challenge the idea and so that I can kind of see where that line might be drawn. As I said, I don't know where the line is drawn. I'm trying to work it out through discussion. To be like a, a political advocate i'd have to know where that line is drawn and advocate for that line like where it should be drawn politically or legally uh i can't do that so i can't i can't argue for for that kind of um political end i instead have to just keep talking about philosophy and hope that we can work out where that line will be drawn at some point in the future but i don't think i'll be the person to do it like yeah i've said things about free speech in the past and someone from channel four saw it on twitter and reached out to me and had me on 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 the news and i was like fine yeah i'll, I'll tell you what i think but I could be wrong about this. I have, I have no idea. Like everything I, everything I do is just about trying to work out, uh, trying to work out whether the kind of intuitions that I hold about certain topics are, are right or whether there's more to it than that. So, you know, I, I want people to understand if, if they kind of listen to what I've just said, that like, this is all subject to change. So I, I suppose when you asked earlier, whether I, whether it's appropriate to call me a free speech activist, it's like, I don't think so. I think if we were going to be really pedantic about it, it would be someone who, from what they've seen so far, philosophically generally gives into the idea that the defense of free expression is a good idea, but can entertain the idea that there are some expressions of ideas which border on uh, infringements upon other rights, which makes it a difficult question about where to draw the line. But that doesn't quite fit into the lower third. So I suppose free speech activists had to do. I, uh, so, but do you think that, um that you maybe have kind of an obligation as such a, a strong voice on ethical issues to comment on political issues because obviously there is a link from um uh, sort of ethics to political philosophy and from the political philosophy into you know politics so say you know you can talk about veganism being the right thing to do and that's philosophy but then if say labor and the green party in an election are endorsing strong kind of laws say a meat tax or something like that and labor aren't and you were to then comment on that, that then is politics. Do you think that your kind of involvement in one kind of obligates you to get involved in the other? I don't think, I don't think it obligates me. Um, I think that generally speaking, nobody should be obligated to speak on an issue that they don't feel confident speaking, speaking about, right? Like it, it might seem intuitive to say, if there's something wrong with the world and you have, you, you have an obligation to speak up about it, but you might be doing more harm than good if you don't really know what you're talking about and you haven't fully formulated your ideas yet. So I think it's unfair to hold people to a standard that says you have to have an opinion on this and you have to express it publicly, especially because, as we were talking about earlier, what happens when five, down, five years down the line, I've done a lot of more nuanced thinking and I've realized that what I said was totally wrong, but it had some influence back then. It's like, that's a big mess, right? So no, I don't think that I would want to speak on that. So for instance, if there were someone advocating for a meat tax, generally speaking, I wouldn't be in favor of a meat tax. I don't think that's the right way to go about it. But I don't really know about uh, enough about the, the science of taxation and the statistical like evidence about what that would actually do to meat consumption or something like that. And the philosophical implications of whether that would be advocating for reducitarianism instead of veganism. Like, I, I don't know enough about it yet 
to offer a offer an opinion on it and the problem is like sure i could spend time trying to figure it out and i reckon if you give me a few weeks i could come to a come to an opinion but politics moves fast you've got to have a, have an opinion on the day that it happens when it happens and so like maybe i'd be obligated to do my research and one day tell you what i think about that thing that happened three weeks ago but i don't think anyone has an obligation to speak about a current event as it's happening if they're not comfortable doing so but if i do think something's wrong and i do think that i know a thing or two about it and i do think that i have a, a fully formed argument to make then if you want to know my opinion on that you you won't have to ask twice oh, fair enough i'm just going to change tack um, a bit just for and last topic of conversation. So you're a, um, a founding member and correct me if I'm wrong, current vice president of the Oxford Democratic Society, is that correct? Yeah, vice president slash co-president slash president elect. Yes. The, the, <laughs> the university doesn't let you have a co-presidency. Our idea was to have a Christian and an atheist <laughs> president, or at least a religious and a non-religious yeah. president. Uh, but we had to officially make me the vice president. But that oh, injustice okay. will soon be corrected next year when I'm at the helm. <laughs> So would you like to, would you like to just plug plug your society? Yeah, sure. I mean, we uh, we took inspiration from a lot of the political societies that existed, like spirited discussions. Uh, I've always enjoyed that kind of getting into a room together and having somewhat lighthearted debates about somewhat important issues. But they were always, as you'd expect, quite political. Sometimes you might have a motion on, on free speech, or you might have a motion on um, I don't know, environmentalism or something, but it's rare that you'd have a motion on the ontological argument for the existence of God or uh, whether sexual desire can ever be intrinsically immoral, right? These really interesting, important philosophical questions we thought deserved a similar kind of debate forum. So that's what we decided to set up. So if people are interested in that kind of spirited discussion style debate of getting together in a room drinking and giving short speeches and points of information, uh, but on issues that are more philosophical that don't require a knowledge of current events or history, but just require a kind of inquisitive mind, then the Socratic society is for you. So obviously, I guess, now it's kind of an apt comparison, but then I guess where um where there's a difference is that while politics these days is, you know, something of a spectator sport that um, horrendously uninformed laymen such as myself can easily kind of have a surface level political discussion about things going on without needing to know about, you know, Socrates, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Philosophy is often a bit more, not highbrow, but um, it can be somewhat, uh, it's less accessible. So would you say that that's your goal to kind of offer a more accessible kind of sort of form of philosophy that people can kind of discuss like they would at say spirited discussion. Yeah, well I think the reason why philosophy has that reputation is because it doesn't have this kind of um, approachable level of of general light-hearted discourse. You know, if you want to hear different opinions on a, on a specific philosophical uh, topic, you're probably going to have to go and read papers. You're probably going to have to go and watch long dry academic speeches. Um, we're trying to create a space where people can can talk about this stuff without it having to be boring, without having to have a, a, a kind of knowledge of all of the lingo that these um, academic papers will be using. Who just want to kind of, e even if they just want to come and listen to these debates being had, but in a short form accessible format, uh, I'd say that probably is roughly the goal, actually. But it's also, you know, it's not like we... Like we do take the issue seriously. We take the question seriously. And I think that the, the, the discussions we have have more of an air of seriousness than some of the political debate societies. Um, they take the, the, the question seriously too, but you know, people, especially as they get more drunk, become a bit more jokey about everything. Like we're actually a, a society of individuals who, who, are, who are really, really interested in every question that we ask. We, we make sure that every time we decide what question is gonna be the one up for debate at the next event, that it's one that we that we genuinely like are conflicted on and really want to know the answer to and think is genuinely interesting. Um, and yeah, we, we kind of have a rule that says if it's a bit too political, we'd rather not do it because that's not our domain. Then we're just stepping on the toes of spirited discussions. Like we're, we're trying to create our own space that people can come to if they're specifically interested in philosophy rather than politics. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I think that's pretty much, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'll, I'll stop the recording there. Sweet.